All right. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me okay. And uh, I wanna thank you everybody for coming. It seems like it's a popular session uh, from the Linux Foundation uh, monitoring, uh, I mean, uh, tutorials. Um, so uh, I have, you know, I have to cover quite a bit of stuff. Um, and so I'll get started and uh, I will, you know, see if you guys are uh, following. Uh, sorry, I was distracting. I see people posting stuff. Uh, if you don't have to answer a question, maybe just, uh, uh, I appreciate if you don't put it on this chat or I'll get this started. Thank you. All right, so uh, let's get started. So the, the talk will cover introduction to Unix, uh, Linux tracing and, uh, and its com con concepts. So the story of tracing uh, is a, a long story and uh, uh, it started as the, the first thing that really was generated and used uh, on Linux, I would, I would you know, is the, the, the famous D-trace system call. Um, is used uh, normally by debuggers to control the programs that, that you want to debug. Um, and uh, it's also used by D-Trace. Um, it provides a way of controlling the execution of a program, uh, uh, you know, in a way uh, that allows the, the program to be some sort of uh, constraint um, into what can, it can do. Uh, some of the actions that are allowed to happen with D with uh, P-Trace are, you know, you can start a process under the control of D-Trace, so therefore the debugger can interact to it. Um, you can attach to an, a program that is already uh, running. Um, you can execute the program because when you start it, it just waits for you to tell it what to do. And you can also interact with the program uh, by setting up uh, reading and write memories on reading and write uh, registers. Uh, so that's, you know, the beginning of, of the history uh, in terms of tracing. It's not really tracing yet, but that's what we have. And here I, I have an example. <clears throat> you probably all know about it. Uh, D-trace, uh, uh, sorry, S-trace examples. Uh, here there is one that can show you uh, the system call uh, that happen during execution. So here I have an execution of a simple commands, ec, uh, echo, uh, hello, and um, uh, you were monitoring the, the system call uh, open and, and bright. So here is, is the output. This is, you know, you can have a much, um, uh, you know, bigger output depending on what you're monitoring. You're just, you know, in a, a small example uh, of uh, system calls that have been called. You have three calls to open and one calls to write. So that's the minimum easier way of kind of get an idea of what the pro program is actually doing. Uh, another way is to get some sort of statistics about the whole program. Uh, and, you know, it will tell you the system calls and the time it uh, used to execute. Uh, so that's one example. There are many, many options in D-Trace, but this is the idea, you know, first, this is a very light to give, to give you an idea of what the behavior of your program is. Uh, <clears throat> other way in history, and I'm going through this to give you some background because I will refer to some of these concepts um, throughout the whole uh, presentation. So for the, the usual way of interacting during a debugging uh, session, is um, basically following this, this pattern, which is basically run, run your program under, obviously under Ptrace to execute until a certain point uh, in, in your code. And then the program stops. And at that point, you can inspect. You can figure out uh, what's going on in your program by printing information. And the information that you normally print, the you know, easiest is to print some variables. It could be global variables, local variables, um, arguments, you know, that are visible in the scope at the point where you stopped. 
And of course, you can figure out uh, aside of what's happening now, what are the values of these variables, the backtrace is also uh, able to tell you how did I, did I get in this particular spot, right? So pretty simple. Um, you can also modify information um, and you can uh, test um, um, uh, an alternative execution path, let's say, where you can actually modify the values of some of the variables. And this is usually done when you try to figure out why this value like x is equal to five, I think it should be two. Let's try to put it equal to two and then continue the execution. So this is kind of what you do when you do a normal debugging session. It's all done interactively under this control envi environment that uh, Ptrace allows you to do. So it's a kind of an artificial, I would say, situation in, uh, where you do debugging because it's not the natural, quote unquote, you know, flow of, of your program, right? You have perturbed the situation. It runs under the under uh, P trace, and uh, you are stopping, starting, you know. So the interaction with the OS and and other things is 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 a little different. Uh, so an important concept that we're, we're using uh, in a sense, but is uh, it's very similar to a breakpoint. So what is a breakpoint? It's a way uh, to stop the execution of a program at a certain instruction of your choosing. You decide, I want to stop the program in this spot. Um, it's the way that the buggers do their work. Um, and basically, the way it works is uh, uh, the, the, the instruction at which you want to stop gets uh, exchanged uh, with an illegal instruction. And the type of this illegal instruction depends on the architecture that you're working with, right? And so there could be uh, just a illegal instruction or some architectures have a specific breakpoint instruction just defined, designed and used for debuggers, uh, etc. So when you re uh, reach this particular point, during execution, you generate an exception and then uh, the debugger takes control uh, through because the trace is involved, right? So it traps uh, and gets taken basically by the OS uh, under control. So it's all done uh, through Btrace. Um, so this is a pretty general, uh, I say, concept that you will see this over and over again in various um, in various forms uh, that are used by also tracing. Not exactly the same, but the idea is the same. So another idea that you probably have seen is profiling uh, beside debugging, right? So profiling is another way of getting an idea about what your program that, that you are interested in is actually doing. The difference here that profiling is usually uh, tied to doing something in a statistical way uh, using sampling uh, that are done with a certain frequency. Um, and usually uh, the events that are recorded are fixed and they are defined often uh, in a targeting PMU events, so the performance monitoring units uh, of various processors, so each different architecture define different ones. Uh, some are, due, are uh, you know, uh, looking at, I don't know, uh, number of branch instructions, executed, uh, misses, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There are very, uh, very many availables. Um, so that's some, somewhat also gives you an idea, a generic idea. So you can kind of zoom in your, your issues, right? You can try a trace, you can try debugging, you can do a little bit of profiling. Um, and then when you have kind of a clue, a little bit, you know, of what your program is doing, assume that you don't know anything about the program, right? You, you can discover, discover how the program actually works using backtraces and stuff like that. Then finally, you can get to the actual uh, argument, um, uh, so the actual topic for, for, for this talk and in general, what you wanna do with tracing. So the idea of tracing is that you wanna collect information about your program and what it does and where it goes wrong, or maybe even when it goes well to see what it actually, it actually do, does. And um, basically 
the, the, the main goal is that tracing uh, should not um, make your program run in, a, in an awkward way, adding overhead uh, and you know, modifying the flow uh, normally. Um, Elena, okay, so um, yes, Elena, uh, could you uh, raise yeah. your volume a bit? Uh, looks like uh, ah, yes, yeah, sure. Oh, how is that? Is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so as I was saying, you know, run and perturb is the main goal of anything that gets added under the, you know, this is part of tracing. So um, again, the idea is to collect information at certain points during the execution of the program. And then once you have this information, you can manipulate the information before presenting it to the user, like you know, filtering or uh, aggregating information uh, presented in a certain way, um, and then display the information collected. Uh, usually, the first this part of collecting the information includes some sort of um, filtering and manipulation is done in the kernel, and then the information gets propagated to user space where. Uh, the, the users can actually uh, see, it, see it. So it's a similar concept, but not quite the same as debugging. This happens in real time. It's not interactive. You know, you just run your program, try to not modify what your program would do without observation, right? Um, and one other point is that you can add, um, as opposed to profiling, normally you can add um, points dynamically where you collect information. Some points are already defined for you, some points you define on the fly, depending on uh, where you actually wanna, you know, take a look and spy on your program. Uh, so let's look at uh, what I used to call a brief history of tracing, but now is actually becoming a very long history of tracing. Um, you know, it's uh, more or less 20 years ago, the beginning of the, uh, mid 2000, 2005, 2004, uh, and forward where things started happening. Uh, um, so there was a bit of, you know, I would say resistance or, you know, difficult to have this stuff integrated, especially, you know, in the kernel. And, uh, uh, you know, at the beginning there was like, well, you know, why do you need this? We can do this using S-Trace and using KGDB and other things, especially for debugging the kernel, right? So there was a little bit of meh, it's, uh, you know, not as, you know, not what we wanna do. Uh, so, but also there was some legitimate uh, issues, uh, which were, as I was talking about before, that adding um, this tracing information and to be able to collect the information would add a lot of overhead and slow down, especially in the kernel. Right, you have to be fast. There are, uh, you know, issues with real times and a lot of other things. Scheduling that you don't want to go and you know mess up because you have added a trace point or something like that. Also, another issue was the developers and the maintainers were worried that once you add points to collect information and these points are added into the kernel code at specific locations, and uh, say that you want to trace, you know one particular part in the scheduler and you want to trace and print, uh, I don't know, parameters of a certain function. And then on top of that, you got scripts and other constructs and tools that we use this, um, uh, this, this, they rely on this information. And they use, you know, function foo with parameters X, Y, and Z but then, you know, the developers feel compelled to maintain those, but maybe that, very, that, um, that function uh, needs to be changed for whatever reason to have a different number of parameters or a different name or a different parameter values and variables. So they were very worried about this problem that the trace points become uh, frozen. So eventually, um, this kind of uh, was, you know, decided uh, to be added, especially static trace points, 
in a way that uh, you know it's not uh, frozen in time uh, or in the kernel, but uh, you know we try to add them. Uh, not we them the kernel materials try to add them in a way that is very um, uh, not easily added. Uh, you know, very uh, reviewed very carefully and very prudent. Okay, so that's why then the development of the, the dynamic tracing has become important because the static tracing uh, is somewhat limited. Nevertheless, a lot of the static trace points have been added, right, in many subsystems in the kernel. Uh, so, and then we're talking about, you know, different tools, different things that have happened, you know, some, you know, the one, one of the first one was uh, LTTNG, Linux Toolkit in the late 1990s. Um, and then we started with K-probes. I have some pointers here of, you know, the first uh, sign of life from these tools, uh, K-probes, uh, System Tap for Linux. Uh, in 2005, LTTNG, which was a rewrite of the original LTTNG in 2006, um, Ftrace as a tool at a bit of a higher level uh, in 2008, Perf at the end, later, it's always in 2008, uh, we have Dtrace for Linux, uh, which we started in 2011, uh, and then, you know, BPF as a, uh, uh, you know, as another type of infrastructure uh, in 2013 for tracing specifically, even though this predates to that particular date. Elena, I have um, a question. Yes. Uh, sorry, uh, that might yes. be better to answer now. Um, can you can you please compare quickly what are the cons and uh, pros and cons for the following? K probes, system tap, LT tracing, F trace, and perf. Yes, I will cover all of this uh, throughout the, the presentation. So okay. uh, Sounds good. if uh, we can postpone this and then if there is any other uh, questions uh, after, towards the end, we can uh, revisit that question, if that's okay. That sounds good. So, all right. So now let's talk, and this is where we're going. Let's talk about the infrastructure, right? As I said, we need to have this infrastructure that allows you to specify the points of interest uh, in, during the execution of the, your program. Uh, you need to be able to specify what information do you want to collect at these particular points. You need to process such information, uh, aggregate, uh, collect in, uh, in different ways, create you know, very ways of representing this information, um, and then pass the result to the user somehow. So, so now, where, where, where comes uh, here comes the probes. <laughs> so basically, again, uh, this is a concept that is very similar to uh, breakpoints in a sense that you, the goal here with probes is to associate actions that are performed at specific addresses when they are reached during the execution of the program, right? So if you're not touching this particular place where you have the probes, uh, the probes does trigger, does nothing happens. Um, and if disabled, nothing happens, but you can insert it at a certain spot. And uh, when the spot is reached, and if the probe is active, then do whatever you want to associate to that particular prompt. So, and as I said, again, the information is generally collect information, sorry, the action, collect information and process the information. There are different types of probes that have been added to the kernel as infrastructure. Uh, we have K-probes and U-probes. K-probes are kernel probes, so probes that are added to the kernel. U-probes are probes that are added to user space. So they are slightly different. The concept is the same, but they are implemented in different ways. And then we have uh, other K-probes, okay, so k probes which is probes at rip. Uh, I will cover that, and you retro. Uh, K-probes are used for tracing the Linux kernel. Uh, they are available for use. You, they are, as I said, this is dynamic, right? You can put them anywhere, well, to some limit, with some limits, but you, the user, the person that is uh, want to know what's going on, 
and uh, you can say I want to have a K probe and this bot do certain things. However, not and it's not always available. You have to configure the kernel with uh, config probes equal yes. There are a lot of configure um, flags or you know in, uh, that you can actually add. Um, you know, at the beginning there was just K probes, and then there were many variants. So, but this remains one of the main ones. Uh, you can surely look at those uh, later. I'll show you uh, where you can actually look at them. Um, as I said, the main concept is similar to the breakpoints. Uh, when you hit uh, that K probe location, the exception is caused, and the kernel takes control and the, uh, through the execution uh, of the exception handler. And uh, it performs the actions that have been specified for that particular probes. And it's usually you know, a building block that is used by all the tracing tools uh, that, that we have in Linux. They more or less also support the K probes and how to specify K probes and how to read the results, etc. cetera. Uh, for U probes, <coughs> it's uh, similar, but this is in user space programs. However, the execution happens in the kernel um, and uh, because it's faster. And so the, 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 the trap is in the kernel and uh, you do uh, the actions and produce the results, passing them to the user space and return the resume, resume sorry, the, the, the user space uh, program uh, again. So this also requires a configuration set up in the kernel, config underscore u probes, uh, equal yes, actually there, it's not just there, it's to be equal yes. Um, it is described as, a, think about it as a location, it's specified as a location, very abstract speaking, right? So if there is an inode, which is the file, uh, an offset in the file, which is the location, and then a list of actions that are what you want to do at that particular point. So it's similar to a breakpoint, right? You say break um, at uh, you know foo.c line 25, and this is similar, right? The file and the location plus the actions. Uh, there are many probes stored in a red and black tree, okay? Um, um, and uh, uh, you can add many mm, probes uh, for the same location and each can have different actions. Uh, it also allows conditional execution as I was saying before, there is a predicate somehow that different tools represent in different ways, but it's basically a filter where, yes, I hit the probe, but hey, I really don't care uh, because uh, some uh, requirement has not been satisfied that, that I care about, right? So I'm not gonna ca um, count that particular hit and add to the statistics or whatever, right? Uh, for, for return probes, basically is, uh, tells you that, you know, instead of, um, if I say break or install a probe at a certain function, it will be at the beginning of the function. Uh, and if you specify, well, I want actually to do the return at the end of the function and see what the function returns, then you use this type of probe called return probes and you have a version for the kernel and a version for the user space. And this one, it, it's a bit more complex, it's a double step or whatever you want to call it. You stop at the beginning of function foo, at that point with the exception handler, it puts a probe at the end of the function at the exit and then runs to there and uh, uh, when the function ends exits the execution of the action associated with the return probes are, is done and then the results are presented to the user. So this is a, uh, an overview of, of, of the type of probes uh, and you know these are, I'll show you then how to actually use this stuff. But first we want to talk about another way which is this static trace point are used for, to define this uh, static defined tracing. And uh, these are probe points in the kernel code. As I was saying, these are maintained and added by system maintainers, kernel system maintainers. Um, there are many in many different subsystems, more are added, etc. Uh, the syntax is uh, universal throughout all the 
all the trace points in the kernel um, so that many tools can just use them because the syntax is the same. Um, you can see how they are defined. There is a file called tracepoint.h, an include file that has the list of all the trace points. But before they're added there, you actually have to define what, the, what they're doing. So there are two components. One is uh, the action that needs to be executed. And so you define under this event directory, include trace event star.h, and it's a bunch of different uh, files, each uh, different for a, a similar area, for a different uh, subsystem, let's say. And you can define one single event, trace event, using that particular macro. Or you can define a class of event, where you say define event and declare event class as a group of events altogether. So once you have defined this, of course, they're not active. They've been defined, but you have to put them in a spot where they trigger. And so the way you do this as a kernel maintainer, I don't know if you are doing this probably as users, you won't see this, but if you want to look at the code, uh, it could be useful for you. And so the way where the stress points are is where there is a function call to a function called trace underscore and then the rest of the function name is the name of the actual trace point. So here is an example of uh, alarm timer dot h. So here is a class, and there are more, but I, I have two here. One is called uh, alarm timer fired, and one other is alarm timer start. As you see, they have the same structure. And then they define a class. Um, called alarm class. And you see this first parameter in the define event is alarm class, which means alarm timer underscore fire belongs to alarm class. And so for the other one, similar. And here you have a structure, um, you know, uh, not structure in the same struct, but you know, in the same way in which it's made, uh, which tells you the prototype of this functions, uh, the name of the arguments, uh, the structure, and then a fast assign. That means uh, what variables can I put into the structure, which is the ones uh, items that will be printed in the print K uh, with the various formatting. Okay, so this is, everything is automated. The assignment and the print, you know, when this thing is straight, is, uh, sorry, it's hit, that's what's gonna happen. Um, and the usage of this uh, trace point. So in the alarm timer.c file, these two particular ones, one is called trace underscore alarm timer fired, uh, inserted. I, I haven't printed everything just to, to show you, you know, but in this particular uh, alarm timer fired function, you see the trace point. And similar in the alarm start function, you see that the trace point call alarm timer start, uh, which, you know, going back to that one matches these two trace point uh, and the stuff that gets printed. So that's how the kernel does this. There are many, many, many of those um, uh, available. So another part um, is uh, the trace FS and the infrastructure and the building block. So this is the system, a file, pseudo file system uh, six kernel tracing, or here actually system kernel debug tracing uh, is mounted as that too. Um, and it is mounted automatically uh, if you have the ftrace configured uh, options, the configure options are set to any of them. So for instance, the easy ones config underscore ftrace equal one. And you can look at this uh, in Fedora, which is what I use, so that's what I tell you. I mean, probably Debian is a little different, but um, uh, in a boot config dash kernel version, uh, you see what's been configured, uh, yes and no, uh, you know, so you can take a look there. Um, and um, there are a lot of these files in the TraceFS that I use to control ftrace. So first let's look here at trace event. That's what you see here. There are a lot of files and the blue are uh, directories. Um, in brief, you know, available events are the events that are actually 
you know, there that you can actually use. Um, available tracers, this is more related to F-trace behavior, um, what F-trace will, will, will uh, um, uh, collect. Um, uh, and uh, these are what's configured in. And then current tracer is what will be traced at that particular, in the particular run. Um, there are, uh, let's see, uh, what is it, trace is a file where the output will be collected. So it's a buffer, it's a trace, trace buffer. Uh, and you can read this uh, trace file. Similarly, you can read the trace pipe. Uh, trace is all consuming and the trace pipe is a read incremental read. Um, and I'll show you the rest of these files, how they're used. Uh, so the next item, so what, what do you do with all this, right? This is the infrastructure that's there and the other um, uh, tools are using, uh, the, the tools are supporting this infrastructure. So F-Trace is a kernel tracer. It monitors different areas and activities in the kernel. And it uses this uh, syskernel debug tracer or syskernel tracing for control and for the output. Um, there is documentation in the kernel um, and these are the files. There is a file that tells you tracing on uh, if it is enabled or not. Uh, trace, as I said, and trace pipe are the output buffers. Available event and tracer are what's available for me to do. Uh, K probes and uh, events and new probe events is a list of the probes that are there. It could be empty if you haven't set because these are dynamic events, right? And then there are a myriad, a myriad of other files for uh, different, uh, much more subtle controls of F-Trace. Um, so here, for instance, um, if you look at available events, you can do a grep for alarm timers. So these are uh, existing static trace points. So I see that there are four things in al alarm timers that are available that some kernel maintainer has put in there already. Uh, each of these, um, there is an alarm timer directory, which has the class. And inside there is a subdirectory, each of which corresponds to each of the timers, be, I mean, uh, trace point uh, belonging to that particular class. And then each of them, alarm timer fired, alarm timer start, has a lot of little files which control how the tracing is done, there is a filter, the format specifics specifies the output that gets printed, enable whether it's on or off. And here are cumulative, you know, so enable uh, up in the alarm timer directory for all of them at once, and then you can do one at a time. A simple example here, um, I can clean the trace buffer by echoing zero or just saying echo actually. Um, I put NOP in the current tracer. I don't want to trace anything um, that is built in in F-Trace, but I want to enable these events uh, that are already defined uh, statically in the kernel, a make directory and a fork when I enter these system calls. So then I tell start the tracing by echoing one in the file, run the little command, I just created a, a directory, and then stop the tracing. And then look at the trace buffer and you will see that the tracer is not because I told, don't give me anything. I just really wanna do this too simple tracing. And then the output shows that there are two things that fired, one in a fork, uh, because with bash, I started the make deer. So that's its own process. And then I fork and I create the make deer uh, and creating a process, as you can see here, the child 61385 is 61385, and that one triggers the make there. So that's one simple example. You can have some use of F-trace with tracers that have been enabled. I mean, um, sorry, that already exist there. And you say, give me a back trace, give me all the function calls. So here um, you have to uh, clean the trace buffer, uh, start the tracing, end the tracing, and in between sleep two. And I forgot to put, but you have to put current tracer uh, equal function. You have to echo that in the current tracer file. And then this, this is your output. So you get a list of function calls and who called who. So mutex 
analog are called by RD, simple write, etc., etc. So this is a list. There is a better view of this. So same story, use the function graph tracer as opposed to the function tracer is another built-in tracer. And this one, again, start the tracing, end the tracing, do a sleep in between, show me the trace file. And here is a, a more elaborate uh, show of your functions get called. Now, this is much longer, so this is just the beginning. Um, it tells you which CPU it is and how long it takes, etc. cetera. Uh, so this is just a little bit of the file, but there is much more uh, in the output. Uh, again, as I showed uh, how to enable various events, so there's uh, the fork, uh, make there, and, and there are different forms of make there uh, system calls in the kernel. Uh, so this is our little example. Um, so for, through trace events, you can actually modify uh, this files, K probe events, and new probe events. You can add by hand, quote unquote. Uh, you can add um, these uh, probes. So here's a little bit, bit of an example. I will show you better here. Um, so set a K probe. So here I create in a probe uh, called my probe with args and my probe no args, right? So they're in the same spot and they do make their IT function, right? Even though there is already a static thing, but I'm just creating a dynamic one. And in the first one, I print a path name and the mode. And in the second, I don't print anything. And I put them in the K probe events and I echo in there with a appending, right? So then I can look at the K probe events subdirectory and I can see these probes have appeared in there. My probe, no args, and all the little files underneath which control this uh, probe on or off, and the same for my probe with args. Then I enable each of them by enabling one in each of these files. And then I clean the trace buffer and I start the tracing doing full, the foobar directory creating a directory, so on, create a directory, off, and then show the tracer. Tracer is still no up. I just wanna see this tracing uh, that I had before. So you see the fork that I had before, you see the make directory triggering, and now I also see my new probes, the make directory, no args, and the make directory with args, and they're printed, the path name and the mode. And you see they're the same location. Now you make, make the uh, T, plus zero, so the beginning of the function. So this is basically what F-trace can do. There is more you can do, but it's all done directly. That will mention there are other ways of doing F-trace through uh, interface called trace command. It's a command line and uh, through a graphical interface called kernel shark, um, which I'm not gonna talk about it, but there will be another tutorial uh, by Steve uh, rusted uh, dealing with F trace, so he can he will go over all this in the next few weeks, I think, or months. So perf is another tool, uh, which is now in the kernel, uh, even though it's a user space tool, but it's st stored in the kernel. Uh, it was started in two thousand and eight as a performance counter interface, uh, initially called perf counters model over perf mon. I don't know if you're familiar with this something. Um, that was created by an engineer, uh, Stefan Aranian at, at HP. And so it was made for Linux uh, with this perf counters. Uh, and it kind of grew, it grew, it grew, it grew. It started incorporating uh, the statistics, but also all this probe support, just like F-Trace. But it's a little bit higher level, so the syntax is a little easier. Um, again, uh, there are different ways of displaying the output. The documentation is in the kernel directory tools perf documentation. Uh, to use it, you want to install the kernel debugging information, RPM, uh, so as a separate kernel RPM. So here's the command yum dash dash enable repo updates debug info install kernel debug info on, on a Fedora um, you know, system. There are many subcommands of so perf stat, which is the traditional statistics, like the perfmon and, you know, all profile type stuff. Perf record is runs a command and stores the output uh, in the output file uh, called perf.data. 
perf report, read the data, perf script actually is another one that reads this data, uh, perf diff, perf tough, perf probe, a zillion of those. I'm not gonna cover them here, but there are many, many, many different sub commands that do different things. But I am gonna talk about the probes here. So uh, that's what's going on, uh, Trade. So let's try to see how can I look at probes here. So perf probe dash f, and then uh, an expression to figure out, you know, where can I put these probes? I really don't know the kernel very well. So I say something that's right pages. There's like a gazillion function that have right pages, but let's focus on do underscore right pages. It's listed as one at which I can put a probe. They're not blacklisted, so let's put a probe in there. So what do I do though? Before I put a probe, I'm curious to see their code, the write page, do write page code. Oh, there it is, because I installed the debug info uh, for the kernel, so I can see this. So you see the body of the function, and then you see the numbers. So the lines where there is a number, you can actually put a probe, but without the number, no. Why? Because it's been optimized by, by the compiler, and so the code has been scattered around, reorganized, so sometimes it's a bit hard to put something in there. So let's see what you can do. Uh, when you know where you want to put a probe in this function, but you also want to see what can I print? What, var what um, variables can I use here? So dash V tells you what you can print. And in this case, you can print mapping and WBC. Those are the arguments. And so let me try putting a probe and to a line number and oops, that's not one of the line number where I'm actually allowed to put the probe. If you go back to the previous slide, you see seven is here, but no, can't do that. Uh, so let's just do it at the beginning. So do write page, um, do, uh, perf probe, do write pages in WBC is what I wanna be printing at that particular spot. So there you go, finally, I'm able to set a thing, a probe. And then uh, now, this is just for your information. It's not something you have to do, but I wanted to show you how this interacts, the higher level setting with the, all the low level TraceFS files. So first of all, you see the, the traces, uh, sorry, the probes with perf that probe dash L. So these are the ones that I set up earlier. I, they're still there. Uh, this one also, and this is the new one that do write pages. Uh, it tells you with WBC, that's what will be printed. And then the other two, uh, these other parameters. Now, do we see this? Oh yeah, I can look at the TraceFS kprobes file and I see those files, they're still there. The kprobes, my probe no arg and my probe with arg. Uh, and also in the probe subdirectory, I can actually see uh, this new one, do write pages, right? So that was added by perf, okay? So you see at the low level, you got the stuff, it appears. Uh, are we sure? Another way to check, you know, you have perf list tells you all the probes that are there, a very big output. But we, let's do a do, look at do write pages. So there it is, it's a probe, I added it. Uh, and also, are there any other probe now that I think about it? So there are probes because there is probe in the name, but if you look at the type, you have the K probes that we have added before and the probe that you added uh, later. And these are all trace point type of events. Uh, and then uh, the last uh, you know, X-ray <laughs> is you look at the K probe events file and there lists the type and what happens, where they are and you know, what will be printed. So that's another way to confirm that what you've done and what you've set up is proper. Then let's try it. So I have a command file that does uh, enter one into a file called sync and it makes a directory. Then let's run perf under the record. And now let's enable only one type of probes, the probes, not the K probes. Uh, and uh, here is A means all the CPUs. G means give me also back trace. R is a raw output when I execute all this stuff, right? Uh, bin sh, command sh. So it does, it tells you, oh, yeah, I got some data. And then 
let's look at the data. And this again, it's a really small part, but perf script shows you the data. So here, white, bright pages was actually used by SH when we started executing uh, this series of commands. Uh, again, by sync, it was also written by sync. And then make dear call the make directory, um, the probe at the make dear at file. And then here you see it prints the argument that I told them the variables WDC, DFD, path names, and so on. Um, and then I can execute only the K probes. I just say K probes star, same command, this is the only change. But then you see that the other stuff does not trigger, but this one triggers the old K probes that I have added. The my probe no arcs and I have my probe with arcs, both triggered by make dear. And uh, one does not print anything and one prints the arguments. So this all kind of connects all these events together. Uh, and then you can actually print all of it by adding them uh, both the K probes and the probes. So there's a lot of flexibility here, run the commands and then per script will pro show you the same outputs, but all together. Also, you can look at the, in the tracefs, K probe underscore profile tells you how many times these probes have triggered. So this is kind of giving you a bigger picture of all these little pieces and how are they all working together. Um, now, what else, uh, whoops. Kinds, missed the typo there, okay. Uh, what perf can do best though is really perf stat. There's a lot of events that perf also monitors without adding probes are usually hardware events, uh, hardware cache events, software events, PMU events, so perf per performance monitoring unit and that is very much hardware dependent and K probe event, uh, sorry, trace point events, which are the ones that are already set statically in the kernel. So a statistic with perf, use perf stat, and then execute the same command. It gives you a summary of what uh, is going on there. Um, and then you can uh, zoom in by, you know, say, you know, I'd wanna look at the branch instruction, branch misses and cycles. So it gives you a certain output just of those little things. You can also do the same command, but you can add dash r3, where that means uh, the same command is repeated three times. So then you can get a statistics in terms of, you know, variation and deviation of, you know, what happens, you know, to get a better idea. Uh, so that's perf when perf started and that's what perf was uh, created for. And then the rest of the stuff was added on top of it. Uh, so those are the two tools uh, that are widely used, you know, depending on what you want to do now. Next infrastructure piece, which gives Elena rise to an yes. Before you switch to BPF, would you like to field some questions uh, specific to K probes? Yeah. If I um, can answer, sure. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, one the one question is specific addresses in probes or addresses of functions in memory or addresses of variables in memory or something else. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can just say the variable name and then everything has been resolved. You can print uh, X, right, in a certain variable. Um, so that's not, you know, you don't have to worry about where the function itself is actually stored. Uh, and for the function, again, you can use the, the, the name of the function. Uh, uh, and then, yeah, I assume you can actually, I don't know exactly, but you can specify the line uh, of that particular function that if you want, or you can specify uh, an offset. Yeah, you, you, it's really flexible. You can do all sorts of stuff um, in locations, except for the static stuff, right? The static stuff is there, it has a name, and that's what you're gonna trigger if you want, if you enable those. Otherwise, you can just, uh, there is a lot of flexibility around how to set these points. You can set at the beginning by default, at the end by default with the return probes. Um, you can set the middle by line number or by offset. Um, you can use predicates. It's really, really, really super, super flexible. You can specify 
instances like the CPU that you're monitoring, there is a lot of stuff that you can do that I'm not covering here. That's, I mean, it would take, you know, a week of, of a presentation uh, to cover everything. But yeah, it's really, really flexible. Does that Hopefully answer your that question, uh, Kulwant? Yes, it answers my question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And if you people want to you know more detailed things, uh, you can send me an email after the talk. You know, I'm always available to answer questions there. So there is one. All righty. Uh, oh, sure. Would you like to take one more? Um, if K and U probes are similar to breakpoints, am I correct in assuming that the uh, modify the instructions of my program or the libraries loaded by my program? If so, at what time does this modification happen? Well, when you set a probe and you enable the probe, then there is a, a, a breakpoint instruction there, right? And then the um, execution of that instruction creates a trap that is uh, where you actually handle the collection of the data and whatnot. So when you disable then the, the trace point, then it becomes, it goes away, right? You're not gonna hit it. And uh, if you have a predicate, you can still hit the breakpoint, but record zero information. So it's, that's kind of the way. I mean, it can be also done in, in more sophisticated way using a jump instruction as opposed to an exception that saves a little bit of time um, but that's the main concept with, with the K probes and the U probes. Okay, oh. let's move on because I'm uh, getting uh, <laughs> it's a lot of more stuff to do, unfortunately. Sorry, folks. Um, so, BPF, what's BPF? Berkeley Packet Filter. Oh, you probably have heard of this. It's the latest thing, uh, it's, you know, center of attention and Everybody's talking about this, as, you know. Um, so it's an infrastructure that allows user-defined programs to execute in kernel space. The program I'm saying here is written in C because that's the easiest way for humans to do it. It does not necessarily have to be written in C. It can be written directly in breakpoint uh, language with their instruction and their registers and blah, blah. But normally now people do it in a higher level language that can be translated into BPF. We have a way to do that in GC now, which actually my team at Oracle contributed um, and originally was only in Clang uh, and LLVM. Uh, but this one translates and generates BPF programs. Uh, there are, since you have programs into the kernel, you're like, oh boy, this is not very safe. But no, there is a verifier in the kernel that tests programs that they don't do infinite loops, they don't do looping, they don't uh, do weird calls. You know, it's all very, very constricted. Uh, the, the kernel has just in time a compiler for several and architectures, uh, ARM64, x64, I think uh, S390, there's a ton of these that are now supported. And it has been around for a while, even though it was used only in the networking space to basically filter packets, right? So it was called Berkeley Packet Filters for that reason. Uh, and it can be referenced in the past, it was called Classic BPF versus Extended BPF, and now it's just BPF, just the same, you know, more or less. Um, <clears throat> so in order to actually run this thing, you need some sort of a helper, out skipping program because it's really complicated to compile the BPF program, load it, uh, enable cer certain thing, pass information around. So I'm not going to get into too much detail here. This probably is another talk in itself. But the programs are different types, many programs uh, types, but they are associated with what they're used to, uh, what they use for, sorry. So there is a socket filter type that's still connected to networking. And here you see there's K-probe, trace point, and perf event. They're connected to tracing. Um, you run a program by using a BPF program run. It's a kernel macro. And you pass the program and you pass a context. Context is a bunch of information that will be used by this program. The type of context changes depending on these various types of programs. 
um, again, this is not something you have, will have to deal with directly as a user, but so you know. Um, so as I said, this BPF, each BPF program is done within a certain context. The cost contest can be used to pass arguments to helper functions as well, um, provide data on which the program operates. So for K probes and probes in general is a register set for trace point will be the format string of that point. That means what will be printed and how. For network working filters, it passes a buffer where you store the information that you're filtering through. Um, then uh, we have helper functions that can be called by a BPF program. These are not random functions. These are functions that are defined by BPF itself. So they are known and they are enumerated uh, and again, they perform different things in different area uh, so on maps. Maps is another way of passing info around, tracing, networking, etc., cetera, et cetera. And this kept grow keeps, keeps growing, this list keeps growing. What are maps? You might hear this, and it's a bit of a complicated uh, concept, but in general, we can say that maps are key value storage, um, and they use again, from uh, transferring programs for BPF to user space and from kernel to BPF programs and share data among BPF programs. Uh, there is a file descriptor. They are used as files, so you open and a BPF sister call returns a file descriptor, and then you close the map with a close on the file descriptor at a later time. So you can pass this file descriptor around different parts of BPF and, and um, sorry, helper functions. Uh, the attributes of a map are the number of elements that they can be stored, the type of uh, the, the key and the size of the value. Again, different maps of types, uh, some for tracing, a stack trace, some for perf event, and blah, blah, blah. And again, as I said, this keeps growing uh, and growing. Now, uh, when I mentioned the VPF syscall really briefly, it's a syscall, which is a huge multiplexer. It can do everything. So it's one zip call, is called with many different variants depending of the um, parameter that you pass, right? So this starts a BPF, creates a map, you know, blah, blah. That's most of the most of the BPF work is done through that. Now, how do we use this stuff? It's all very complicated. I mean, I have a talk that I did at LinuxCon several years ago when this stuff came out. And um, it is really gnarly, as they say. Uh, there are a lot of details and you're like, oh, come on, that's crazy. So basically there are tools that have been written on top of BPF. So I wanna mention here the BCC, the BPF compiler collection is a set of many little programs that perform common tracing and performance analysis uh, tasks. Uh, they are written in Python. Uh, they, they use LLVM and not GCC. Uh, so they are not specifically to tracing, and you can also, they have an API that specifies some common operations that you want to do with BPF. So normally I assume people look at this, an example that's similar to what you really want, and then you kind of modify like a few attempts on writing a script. An example comes with BPF, uh, sorry, BCC tools, uh, RPM, that you can install. and. Uh, um, in the user share BCC, this is on Fedora. Um, and one parameter, sorry, one script uh, uh, tells you the um, exec calls. I tried it on my Fedora 34 machine. Um, I got a bunch of warnings, but in the end I did get an output. Um, and then I control C it, obviously you stop because it's continuous and it tells you uh, what happened what P called, what parent P it was, the number of, um, of the function call, uh, the arguments, and um, you can do this really easy, one-liner. But if you look at the length, it's 307 files of code. So it's like, whoa, okay. So this is unfortunately the nature of the game here. So this is with the BCC BPF type of infrastructure, the first layer on top of BPF. It might evolve, it might evolve in something else, but now that's what we are. So let me talk about D-Trace. This is something that it's available on Linux. 
is uh, something that my team has done since 2011. We ported it to Linux from Solaris. It's a very well-known tool, uh, very well documented. It has been ported to different OS like uh, BSD, FreeBSD, uh, Windows even. A few months ago, there was an announcement by the Microsoft people, uh, Linux, uh, which is us, et cetera. Um, so it's very high level. It, uh, it's very powerful. And it's easy enough to do very basic and simple tracing, but also to allow complex tracing with many probes in many spaces. Uh, and then a higher level manipulation of the data. Uh, it's stable as an interface, you know, and it's also stable as uh, a, 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 a thing to run in your system, always on to see if you are intercepting some problems. I don't know, some files that shouldn't be open and they're open, I don't know. Um, as I said, in the first version was in 2011. We've been you know, working on this since, adding features, making it parity with Solaris. And now in the last year, year and a half, we are implementing it um, without the kernel patches that we were using in the first version. So basically what we were doing, the first version of the trace was a more of a verbatim and also verbatim, but you know, very similar architecture as the D trace on Solaris. There was a lot of support in the kernel itself. At that point in 2011, there wasn't as much infrastructure into the kernel as there is today. So now we can actually deviate from the original infrastructure that required a bunch of kernel patches and re-implement it as a user space facility with fewer uh, kernel patches. We have a few variants, um, sorry, a few patches that we're actually trying to propose upstream as becoming part of the kernel, a couple of features, not a lot. And they've been previously discussed and we thought, oh, we should use those. And now we actually want to have them in the kernel. But more, uh, everything else is done in user space. So D-Trace is like a single thing to install. Um, not, not a lot of packages. Um, it's just a user space utils. Uh, so it, today, it, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it leverage, it leverage uh, BPF and other kernel facility like the TraceFS system and installing K probes, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can see it on GitHub and uh, it's available and there's a mailing list and it's available as RPMs on Oracle Linux at this point. We hope it will be available on other Linux flavors going forward. So we have actually some ways of running it on uh, Ubuntu and Fedora without a lot of changes, but it's not right at the moment distributed with them. Anyway, so the D trace three architecture, as I said, do a lot of stuff in user space. The kernel provides probing mechanisms already, which didn't in 2011, 2010, when we started. BPF can give an execution engine for all these uh, programs that are associated with probes. We attach these programs to the probes and the, the programs that are created are the clauses specified in D-Trace. The output is written to the same perf event buffer that is read by perf and F-Trace. Um, and D-Trace reads that, uh, presents it, manipulates it, and then all it, all it needs also are contained. Um, as I said, the D clause that you, you specify either in the scripts or in, the, um, in a script or on a uh, command line are associated to each of a BPF uh, program. Uh, the way we connect PPF with, uh, with our programs in D-Trace is to use a trampoline uh, that uh, then D-Trace does, uh, sorry, that BPF executes and then connects to the actual work that the trace does um, uh, that happens at the trace point, sorry, just uh, and that's what I'm trying to say. The trampoline calls the BPF functions for the probe clauses. So the trampoline, the BPF itself is a little bit uh, restricted in what it does. The trace stuff is done after the trampoline is executed. So here is a quick diagram of what happens in the kernel space and what happens in user space. So in user space, you start from a script here at the bottom right, uh, which is different clauses put together. The clauses are compiled into BPF program. 
at the same time, the probe is defined to use providers that are defined always in user space. So for each of these clauses, you create uh, or use uh, K probes, U probes, or trace points, depending on what you want to do in your script. So the creation of a K probe, the creation of a U probe, or the use of a trace point. This will be reflected through modification in the trace FS, as I showed you before. Uh, and then it is associated with a, a perf event uh, with a BF, BPF program attached to it, which has been compiled from the D clause to BPF language uh, using GCC. We use GCC here. So, simple example uh, this is the code, uh, sorry, the script. Uh, you basically every one second you have a tick uh, element, and every one second you just print i and increment i, nothing. And at the end, you print i, the value of i at the end. So, pretty simple. So, here you see in an action, you call the trace with a script tick, tick uh, dot d. Uh, it prints one, two, three, five, six, and then prints the total results. Nothing exceptional. But the reason I did this is because this can run in the background. So while that running in another window, I'm like, let's look at what actually happens in TraceFS, right? So there you have it. You see probes that have been added by the trace by executing this program to the U probe events. These are begin and end probes that are always there uh, by the trace, created by the trace, the beginning of the tracing and the end of the tracing. So you can actually activate commands at the end, as we saw. Uh, and then uh, you can use a tool called BPF tool if you want to see. Oh, let's see. Did I actually create BPF program with D-Trace? Oh, yeah, I did. There they are. Uh, there is one at the end, uh, one at the beginning, and one to actually do the stuff that I need to do. So this BPF tool is part of the BPF infrastructure, and it shows you the programs that are in. But that's not all. The best way of seeing what the D-Trace is doing is actually enabling the disassembly on the command line. And eight is the powerful uh, disassembler, sorry, the, the, the level of the disassembly is most powerful is with eight that shows you the actual final instruction for each of the programs, BPF programs created. Now here I uh, truncated because it is a pretty big output. So then I realized, oh, well, the first three instructions are the same. <laughs> but anyway, so you see the begin, the end, and the tick one second instruction, which correspond to the three ones that we saw in the previous, right? So, but then if you want to see it, you have to see the whole output. A uh, more complicated F, uh, file that you can use script with tracing and detrace. Here you can do uh, a lot of things. Uh, and then you can, I'll show you what that does. Um, and uh, you can run it with the script. And this produces a histogram and the timing, how much time you spend in each system call. And then you print some statistics at the end that tells you, you know, the number of calls, how much time spent in each call. Um, and then the standard deviation spent in each call sorted by error number. So you grouped, sorry, not sorted, grouped by error number right here is one of the parameters that you're looking at. And then uh, at the same, the same information is uh, sorted by a function, but presented as a, a, a histogram. So this short command gives you a long output. So it's dash o foo, but I printed a little bit. It's uh, on three different slides, but so the number of calls, it just tells you, you know, the number of uh, name of the functions one time a set four was called and closes the highest call 24,000 time. And let's look at this one, connect, oops, connect for 25 times. And then how long time, how long has been spent inside each? So for connect, I spent, you know, this much time. Um, and then let's look at the output, the rest of the output. Again, I'm trimming here to just to look at the connect, but for each of those functions printed in the previous output, you have this type of output. So for each error number, so correct has an error number 111, um, connect has an error number of two, and connect returns an error number of zero. And how many time has been spent? Uh, the standard deviation, actually, this is not the actual time, but standard deviation. 
So you can see that 111 was only at one time. So the deviation is zero because it was only called one time. And this is how much time it was spent. For the instances where it was returned twice, you have this <laughs> time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. okay. Please mute uh, yourself. Is that a, a question? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and here again, return is zero, uh, error number zero. And this is, you know, how many times it got printed. So here you can take a look instead of reading all the number, just look at the histograms and say, oh, this one was a bit odd. It was very outlier. So maybe something was going on there. And then you can zoom in and see. Uh, then uh, other parts of the output, as I said, the number of bytes has been outputted here. And uh, you can, you know, basically just an example. So another little example with D-trace. D-trace does N system call entry, uh, is back name, so it's the name of the executable and how many times. So calls, system calls. So the system calls uh, were found 319 calls to system calls in general. Uh, sorry, the probes that are entered, not the number of times. So many probes have been uh, triggered. And that's the total number. So the trace called 979 system calls, uh, you know, network manager calls and the 28 system calls, you know, it's kind of a way of showing things. So that is the trace. And then, and we're almost done folks, and I know it's taking a long time, but another last, um, recent contribution is this BF, BPF trace, which is an attempt of doing D-trace on Linux, although I would say not exactly there yet, but um, so it's a collection of script. It's not a tool by itself. It's a, it's a wrapper. It uses BCC, the, uh, the previous, uh, uh, sorry, uh, BPF compiler collection uh, and it's a bit of a higher level on top of that, provides a bit of a higher level syntax, a similar attempt to be similar to D-trace. And of course it uses B BPF. Uh, and there are also a system, uh, a set of scripts that do already stuff to start with. You don't have to write it yourself. An example, oh, this should have been read, but okay. It's the same thing as the previous example. So here you have to tell though, Trace point, Ross's call, six center, and then uh, the count. If you, sorry, if you compare, and then here it gives you who calls and how many function calls were done. And if you look at the previous example, the syntax was a little, is a little simpler, simpler. So you monitor a system call, the entry of all the system calls, and then because you're not specifying a name, right? So this is the system call group, entry of them, all of them, and I want to put the executive, the executive, the executable name of the process uh, and count how many and put uh, an array basically of, of all of this. And so here is a little bit more, requires a little bit more uh, knowledge of all the underlying stuff. Uh, so it's not exactly equivalent, but almost. So last slide, other tools, trace command. Um, as I said, is a front end from Ftrace. It's a user space uh, tool. You can find it in, uh, in Git. It's maintained by Steve Rusted. Uh, and uh, it works with kernel shark, which is written on top of that. And kernel shark is a GUI and it will show you all this uh, information in a bit less, um, I won't say painful, but you know, easier way. Uh, then we have system tab, which I wanna mention briefly, even though I don't have slides on it, but it's a, a neat tool that was started in 2005. And um, it's a little ironic in the sense that, you know, the history of tracing. <laughs> uh, so system tab, uh, what does it do? You write a program in a scripting language similar to D and similar to C, it's a bit middle of the road. And it gets compiled into a C program, which, you know, sorry, into, yeah, into an executable from C with 
a lot of constraints and this is that's treated as a kernel module that gets loaded. Uh, that's the way system tab started. I think now it's changed a little bit. Uh, it was kind of, you know, ah, bad idea, terrible. But <laughs> at the end, what does VPF do? It's very similar, right? You compile something and then you execute it in the kernel. And this was basically the same idea. So after 10 years, ah, uh, yeah, let's do VPF. <laughs> So it is, uh, it is kind of funny how things actually go full circle, right? With a little bit of variation, but you know, we're there. And so SysNetApp is still available. And I believe now it's actually implemented also on top of BPF. So one day BPF won't be good. And then we will have to re-implement all of these tools again on top of whatever uh, infrastructure of the day shows up. But, you know, it's good. It's good to see that people are thinking about new things and new ways of doing things and uh, uh, make it stable and so on. And then LTTNG is the other uh, thing you can have it. You can see LTTNG.org also still very widely used as a statistical analysis tool and so on. And that is it. And I appreciate, sorry, it took a long time. Any questions? Uh, yes, uh, a couple, I will, I will uh, ask them in an order that pro makes sense, Elena. Um, does re-architected, re-architectured D-trace use breakpoints? Uh, well, it uses K-probes, right? So K-probes uses breakpoint or illegal instruction. So yeah, but not directly, right? We, we set a K-probe or we set a U-probe, which then is implemented by doing X, Y, Z, which is, you know, setting a jumps if they're optimized or whatever. So yeah, it's the same. It's all the same thing. You want to get to a point in your program and inspect what the heck is going on there. But for a debugger, when you're at, uh, at the breakpoint, everything is stopped and it's up to you and you take a look. But here, no, 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 we don't want to stop. We don't want to perturb. We just want to do like ta, 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 in and out, continue. But the idea is similar, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Next question is, what is the advantage of D-Trace over system tap, ignoring support for OSS other than Linux? Uh, well, the syntax for D-Trace, I think is very um, simple and flexible. Um, and you can do a lot of uh, manipulation of the data. Uh, without having to invent a wheel. It's all there already, number one. Uh, you can, uh, you know, do histograms. You can do, uh, I don't know, a lot of other things. Um, there are some examples. Um, actually, I, there is a blog entry that we have that uh, shows some complicated examples that you can do really easily. So the, the advantage of the trace is really the flexibility of the syntax and the fact that you don't have to. Um, and a lot of the stuff is done behind the scene. All the stuff I showed you of how it's done, you don't really have to even know uh, about it. While with other tools, you have to go at a lower level of, of, of uh, operating all this, uh, uh, yeah, lower level tools. Okay. Um, how much granularity these tracing tools, especially EBF, eBPF, can provide? Uh, again, a lot, um, because, you know, depending on how low uh, you can go and how many variants of the various parameters uh, in, in, in specifying the programs, right? So, yeah, I didn't go too much detail into BPF. Uh, detail, but um, uh, but you can specify the, the programs directly if you want, or you can use this BCC uh, or uh, examples. So yeah, I mean, as an infrastructure, is relatively flex, is very flexible. Yeah, great. It's uh -huh. it's it's all. Um, I would say, mm, uh, how can I say, limited, but not in a bad sense. 
constrained by the verifier, right? There are some things they can do, some things you cannot do. Uh, BPF itself, it's much bigger than this, right? It can trace, um, it can do stuff in the, uh, in the kernel. Uh, you can do tracing, but you can do stuff with the networking. I mean, if you look at it now, it's used in many different spots. Uh, you can also now do, uh, instead of compiling your program, you can reuse, compile once and execute many times. It's called core compile and uh, re-execute. So you can do this with LLVM. The problem, my, my, my point of view, right? I'm a GC, GNU type person, LLVM, CLang, very complicated, huge libraries. So now, again, my team is doing work to put all the BPF stuff into GCC. So we have the BPF, we have BTF, um, and we also have uh, core, core, C-O-R-E, Core, uh, that we're working on and proposing patches right now, actually. So we are trying to simplify things, uh, doing an equivalent behavior on GCC. Um, another part I didn't mention is this debugging information, right? So there is regular debugging information, uh, dwarf, right? Which is used by debuggers all over the place. Uh, uh, Perf uses that, as I said, load the debugging info before RPM. Um, but there are other levels of more compact debugging info. One is CTF. CTF was used in Solaris and Btrace uses CTF. And again, we are putting that into GCC. And we hope that uh, instead of Dwarf, people can use CTF for production instead of using Dwarf. And Dwarf will stay in their debugging info RPM, but CTF is much smaller. So you can get at least a little bit of debugging info by adding it to your executable and putting that into the production RPM. So we're getting there again with GCC uh, and the utils, the stuff has been contributed. Um, the GCC stuff is under review right now. Uh, we are writing the ver new version again. Uh, there is BTF, which is a der derivative of CTF. And that's another thing that's been used by some of these tools, especially LLVM, and is a subset of CTF. So we are supporting that as well into the GCC tool chain. So I mean, there is a lot, a lot going on these days. And all this stuff is coming from all over the place where your teams are working on, you know, uh, the uh, BPF infrastructure, the Facebook, uh, with, you know, Alexei Starovoitov, uh, groups are working on uh, this other thing. Um, uh, Cilium is a company. That was, so there's, there's a lot of activity. So now, while the K-probes and stuff is now stable, now this BPF stuff, it keeps expanding and changing a little bit. So maybe in a few months, so we have something different uh, in that area. Uh, we're so, coming up on time, time, I think. I'll ask one last question, Elena. We can see um, where yeah. we go from there. The same trace points and associated info are available via a variety of user space tools. Any advice about best yes. practices for choosing tools to run monitors in production? Yes. Uh, so, I mean, if you want to do performance monitoring and figure out things like that, use Perf which is equivalent to O-Profile or whatever. So that perf stat gives you that area. Uh, <clears throat> for more ad hoc probing, then yes, uh, use um, uh, the, the other tools. I mean, in the end, they all use the same, uh, the same mechanism. So it's a little hard to say, you know, of course, if you just output stuff and control stuff through echoing things into the little three ICFS files, that's the least stuff that you have to do, right? It's a bit, it's more cumbersome. If you want, you know, multiple clauses, predicates, then something like Btrace is good uh, because that allows you to specify uh, more things from a higher level. It, it all depends, you know, a lot of these tools have to be run as root. That's the other thing that I didn't mention, but you saw in the examples, uh, they are run as root. 
So that might be another constraint that you might want to have. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I think there isn't a, a directive or a, or a simple answer as to what to use what. I think you might, first of all, personal preference, what are you more familiar with? You, you, you know, you start learning a language, a dialect kind of comes out of a certain, using a certain subset of programs and commands. So I don't know, it's, it's uh, very personal. We have several questions. Uh, please, uh, would it be okay if they sent you email, um, Elena? With Absolutely. Those Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. There please are do. two emails, either the Gmail or the Oracle one. Uh, up to you guys, whichever you want to use. Okay, wonderful. And as a reminder, those. Um, those email addresses will be on Elena's slides, which will be posted to our Linux Foundation website later today, along with a recording of this presentation. So thank you so much to Elena for her time today. And thank you to all of the participants who joined us. We hope that you will join us for future mentorship sessions. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you.